All right, today we are going to take a tour of the cell and ignore it where it says chapter four here. Um, that's in the textbook that I use to take notes from, but you guys don't have a textbook um, for this class. All you have is, is really notes. And so these notes today are gonna be pretty detailed. And the reason for that is because I know that you guys have gotten a lot of education already on parts of the cell. I know Miss Nickel, at least in seventh grade, um, does a lot of that and most likely whatever school you did come from in seventh grade they do a lot on parts of the cell um, the other reason is because we do go through this pretty quickly if you are moving on to ap and so you will see this slideshow and actually these notes again in ap but we spend one day on them kind of like we spend one day on them in this class so i figured since you aren't really required to memorize anything in this class because everything is open notes since it is virtual that i was just going to go ahead and give you the detailed notes for parts of the cell that i would expect a student to have in the um, ap class for those of you that are moving on all right, so we're gonna talk just really briefly about microscopes. You're going to have a virtual activity today where you look at different parts of the microscope and you look at slides under the microscope. Um, it's important to understand that there are two types of microscopes, light and electron. What we use in our class is the light microscope because we can afford them. Um, we can't afford an electron microscope because they cost about a million dollars. I've actually never personally even looked into an electron microscope before, although I know some students do internships where they actually have um, the opportunity to look at one. Um, so light microscopes are going to be right here. So this is what they're going to be able to see. Frog eggs, human eggs, plant and animal cells, bacteria cells. So that's what we would be looking at if we were in the classroom or those things. The electron microscope is going to be able to see all obviously all of the things that the light microscope can see, but then it's going to be able to see the smallest bact bacteria, viruses, ribosomes, and then some proteins. So the electron microscope can definitely magnify a lot more. And then this is what they look like. So the light microscope, this is what you would see in our classroom. And then the electron microscope, that's what you would see in like a, a really sophisticated lab. Here's what some of the images would look like under a light microscope. Um, you could stain specimens. Um, you can use fluorescent dyes. Um, and, and you really just see like a flat image. Um, a scanning electron microscope is going to be able to see something um, that's more like 3D in appearance. And then the transmission electron, electron microscope is going to see like cross sections. All right, so the big difference that I need you to know, obviously, are the cost, but that the light microscope cannot magnify as well. It can go up to, or it can go, it can magnify up to the size of a bacteria and it can't go any smaller than that. The electron microscope can do bacteria and then you can also see viruses, ribosomes, and some proteins. So to compare the two, and you can just paraphrase this, you don't have to write down every single word, a light microscope obviously is going to lose, use light. So I wouldn't write that down because that's what the name implies, it uses light. And an electron microscope is going to use a beam of electrons. This can magnify up to 1000 and then it's also important that's to know that specimens can be alive. So I would just put magnify up to a thousand specimens can be alive. So we can actually see like paramecium swimming under a light microscope in the classroom. An electron microscope is going to focus a beam of electrons. So the name implies that, so I wouldn't write that down. It can magnify up to one million times. The specimen is non-living and it's in a vacuum. So that's something important to make note of is with an electron microscope, the specimen is not alive. And electron microscopes can see in black and white um, most of the time, um, except for these ones right here are in color. So it just depends on which type, but most of the time it's gonna be black and white. All right, let's go through the different types of cells. So those are your two types of microscopes. We use light microscope for our class at St. Mary's Hall and in any high school, really. Um, what I need you to know the difference between is prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes. 
When you think prokaryote, I want you to think bacteria. When you think eukaryote, I want you to think plant and animal. So prokaryotes are bacteria, eukaryotes, plant, animal, and then we're going to put protists and fungi under that. But really for cell biology, we're just going to compare plants and animals today. Um, and so everything goes under eukaryote except for bacteria. That's an easy way to remember it. All right, here is a diagram of what a prokaryote would look like. Notice it has a cell wall. So I would definitely circle that. It has a cell wall. Um, and then also notice it has ribosomes and it has DNA, but no nucleus. I think that's the most important thing about a prokaryote is that it has no nucleus. And then our example obviously would be a bacteria. All right, so those are the things I would just like to point out for this class is there's a cell wall, there's no nucleus, and they, but they do have ribosomes. They don't have any other membrane bound organelles. All right, so a prokaryote has no nucleus, so I would definitely write this down. No nucleus. DNA is in the nucleoid region, but has no nucleus. A eukaryote has a nucleus with the, it has a nuclear envelope. So definitely prokaryote, no nucleus, eukaryote, nucleus. I'm trying to give you all time to write this down. They both have cytosol. Cytosol is like the, the jelly-like fluid. Um, a prokaryote has no organelles other than ribosomes no organelles other than ribosomes. Eukaryotes have many membrane bound organelles with specialized structures and functions. So if you're trying to write that down, I'd pause right now because I'm about to move on. Prokaryotes are small, eukaryotes are much larger. Prokaryotes are considered primitive, eukaryotes are a lot more complex and larger. And then there are your examples of what goes under prokaryote bacteria and archaea. And we discuss archaea in more detail in uh, AP, but archaea are really just your extreme bacteria. Really, they are just like bacteria. They live in extreme environments like hot springs or in really salty environments. And then your eukaryotes, plant, animal, and then fungi and protists. So I am going to switch the slides. So if you still need more time, go ahead and push pause. So why do eukaryotes need a nucleus? Uh, eukaryotes need a nucleus because they have a lot more DNA and they're much more complex and they're much more uh, larger. So it's an organization thing. All right, so let's talk about the size of cells. So we need to know why, why a cell is more efficient when it's small. And it has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. A large surface area to volume ratio, so you need to put surface area to volume ratio, is going to allow an increase in chemical exchange between the cell and its environment. So if you had a cell that was giant like this, it wouldn't be able to interact and have chemical reactions and exchanges between it and its environment. But then when you have all of these tiny cells, it increases the surface area to volume ratio. So you're able to have more interaction with the um, environment, right? So the smaller the cell, the more efficient it is because it has a larger surface area to volume ratio. That means if you measured the surface area and you divided it by the volume, it would be larger the smaller the cell is. All right, so here's an example of something we can kind of relate this to. So the small intestine has um, highly folded surface to increase absorption of nutrients. So the villi are like these finger-like projections and microvilli are the projections on each cell. And they're really teeny tiny and they're like folded in on each other, right? And so what that does is that increases the surface area to volume ratio, which increases efficiency. So you wouldn't want one, just one flat intestine. It wouldn't be able to absorb as much if it didn't have these folds and then the little hair-like projections. So hopefully that is not super confusing. Um, it's something that I definitely would ask about in the Zoom if you're having trouble with understanding the smaller the cell, the more uh, it can exchange 
chemicals between the, it, it and its environment and therefore it's more efficient. And then another example of surface area to volume ratio would be root hairs in a plant. So it has teeny tiny little root hairs and what that does is it increases the efficiency of absorbing water and minerals. So root hairs are going to increase the efficiency of absorbing water and minerals. So all this is showing when I talk about the small intestine, when I talk about root hairs is the larger the surface area to volume ratio, the more efficient something is. Therefore, the smaller the cell is, the more efficient it is. So hopefully that connection is made. All right, let's start talking about all of the organelles of a eukaryote. So I told you the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but now I'm gonna move on to eukaryotes and all of their organelles. So the nucleus is the control center. It contains DNA. It's surrounded by a double membrane called the nuclear envelope. And that is continuous with the endoplasm. That just means that the nuclear envelope, the little envelope that surrounds the nucleus is connected to the endoplasmic reticulum. The nuclear pores are like little holes in the nucleus. And so things can enter and things can leave. Chromatin is actually what the what DNA inside of the nucleus is called. DNA isn't just like chilling by itself. DNA is always wrapped around proteins and those proteins help organize it and compact it into chromosomes. And so DNA with its proteins that it's wrapped around is called chromatin. Chromatin that is condensed makes up chromosomes. And we will go over that again when we talk about cell division. All right, and then the nucleolus is the very center of the nucleus, and that's where ribosomes are made. All right, so I'm about to click, so if you're not done writing, you're going to want to pause. All right, and here's a picture of showing you everything I just talked about. This entire thing is called the nucleus. It has a nuclear envelope, and it's in just a protection, uh, kind of like the cell membrane. It's continuous with the ER, so you see right here it's connected to the ER. Um, there's nuclear pores, there's little holes in the nucleus that, where things can enter and things can leave. DNA and its associated protein is called chromatin and that's going to basically be the, the bulk of what's inside the nucleus. The nucleolus, look at the center thing, the nucleolus is the very center of the nucleus and that's where ribosomes are made. And I think I went over everything and so what this is doing is just showing you the blue stuff is DNA, the purple is the proteins. And so DNA wrapped around these proteins is called chromatin. All right, let's talk about ribosomes. Um, ribosomes, the function, they don't synthesize. I, I kind of don't like this um, description right here. I would rather you write down the site of protein synthesis because ribosomes don't really do anything to make proteins, except they're the place where proteins are made. Um, when we talk about protein synthesis, you'll see what I mean. They're just the place. So they're like the building. That would be like saying school is the teacher. School's not the teacher. School is where teaching happens. And so the ribosome is the place where proteins get made. And that will make a lot more sense later. So please put site of protein synthesis, not protein synthesis, it's site. Okay, moving on. It is made up of rRNA, so ribosomal RNA and proteins. And we talked a little bit about what RNA is. RNA is a nucleic acid. It's single-stranded. There is a large subunit and a small subunit. So if you look at it down here, it's kind of like a hamburger bun. So your hamburger has like kind of a bigger one on top and a smaller one on bottom. And it does open up kind of like a hamburger and you put uh, RNA in the middle. What do you talk about protein synthesis? That'll make more sense. Okay. There are two types of ribosomes. There's free and there's bound. Free are floating in the cytosol and they are going to be the site of protein production used for that cell. And then bound ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and they are actually going to make proteins or they're going to be the site where proteins are made that are going to be exported from the cell, that are going to leave the cell. So free ribosomes, bound ribosomes, I would just like for you to know where they are. You don't have to know which proteins they make um, for this class. Free are going to be floating around. Bound are going to be actually on the endoplasmic reticulum. 
All right, that is ribosomes. If you're not done writing, please pause. I'm about to click. All right, we'll talk a little bit about the endomembrane system. It's called the endomembrane system because it's actually made out of membrane. And we haven't talked about cell membrane yet. So for this class, um, if you haven't been exposed to that yet, um, the cell membrane is made out of the phospholipid bilayer that we talked about um, the other day or yesterday. And so just know that the endomembrane system is made out of membrane, which is made out of the phospholipids. And so the endoplasmic reticulum is part of the endomembrane system. It's a network of membrane and sacs. You have the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER is where um, proteins are going to be packaged for secretion, meaning proteins are going to be packaged to leave the cell. The smooth ER has no ribosomes. So here's a function of the smooth ER. Synthesize lipids, metabolize carbohydrates, detox from drugs and poisons and it stores calcium. So just a lot of jobs that you aren't required to memorize at this point, um, but in AP you actually are expected to have this memorized. So just so you know, if you're signed up for AP, what you're getting yourself into. Right, so that's rough ER, smooth ER. What makes the rough ER rough is that it has ribosomes on it. It's like little rhinestones. Smooth ER doesn't have any. All right, so if the smooth ER detoxes the cells from drugs and poisons, which cells in the body do you think have the most smooth ER? Detox, so that should kind of be your clue. And if you don't know it, that's fine. I wouldn't expect you to already know this. It's just kind of a little interesting tidbit. Um, the answer is liver. Your liver cells would have more smooth ER than any other um, cells in the body, your, your liver and, and most likely your kidneys because they detox. Okay, and then you do have a picture, goodness, uh, you have a picture on your um, notes that shows you that smooth ER and rough ER are continuous with each other, but rough ER just has ribosomes. All right, which other cells would have a proliferation of smooth ER given that it's responsible for the production of sex hormones? That would The answer to that would be the ovaries and the testes. And I wouldn't expect you to know that because that's anatomy stuff. All right, and so here's your smooth ER and then there's your rough ER. And it's continuous with the uh, nuclear envelope. Cool. Next up would be the Golgi apparatus. It's still part of the endomembrane system because the Golgi apparatus is just made of membrane. It's made of a phospholipid bilayer. So the function of the Golgi apparatus is to synthesize and package materials for transport. And um, it transports things in these little bubbles called vesicles. And vesicles are, are, yeah, they're like little cars that are like moving around the cell. And they're little circular things and they're made up of membrane. Um, the Golgi apparatus is also going to produce lysosomes. And I discuss lysosomes on the next slide, so I'm not going to get into that right now. Just know that um, that is where they are made is in the Golgi apparatus. All right, it's a series of flattened membrane sacs. And so it's like, um, if you could compare it to, I don't know if you did this in middle school, but sometimes they compare um, the cell to like a city. And so if the cell was a city, the Golgi apparatus would be the post office, right? For all the proteins that are made from the rough endoplasmic reticulum get sent to the post office to get packaged and processed and stamp put on it and a zip code put on it and all of that stuff. So that would be your um, analogy, I guess. Um, the cis face is going to receive ve vesicles from the rough ER. The trans face is going to ship vesicles. I wouldn't expect you to know cis face, trans face um, for this class, but just so you know, it receives vesicles from the ER and then it ships vesicles towards the membrane. And obviously these are for um, packaging and transporting out of the cell, so they would leave the cell. All right, so lysosomes, which are made in the Golgi, are like the intracellular digestion. So this would be like your recycling plant. Um, it's going to recycle things so that the materials can be used later. And it's also going to be responsible for programmed cell death, which is called apoptosis. And so whenever a cell gets too old and is, you know, the older the cell gets, it's kind of like people, you know, old people, you got to take their driver's licenses away sometimes and, and stuff like that. It's kind of like the same thing with a cell. The older they get, the more likely they'll make mistakes. And so when a cell reaches its age, 
where it can no longer function appropriately, the lysosomes will release these things called hydrolytic enzymes. And hydrolytic means they use, it, the enzyme uses water to chop things up. So basically the lysosomes release hydrolytic enzymes and the enzymes use water to chop up everything in the cell. And it gets recycled and used, the whole cell gets recycled and used, um, but that's basically what a lysosome's job is. Lysosomes are also responsible for phagocytosis, which is cellular eating, okay? And um, digestive enzymes from the lysosomes, it merges with this vesicle and then it digests it. All right, so all cells rely on lysosomes, but in particular, protists and amoebas cannot digest their food without them. Fun fact. White blood cells that engulf bacteria kill bacteria using lysosomes. Fun fact. So it's kind of the same thing. If a white blood cell is engulfing a bacteria, a lysosome is going to merge with it, and that's how it kills the bacteria. All cells use lysosomes for recycling waste and eventually use them for apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. All right, lysosomal enzymes that break down lipids in the brain are absent with a person who has Tay-Sachs disease. So they are missing lysosomal enzymes. And you don't need to know this. I'm just trying to make it a little bit more interesting and applicable. Um, so a person with Tay-Sachs disease is going to have a buildup of toxic lipids that destroy neurons in the brain. And the symptoms are going to be loss of coordination, loss of speech, unresponsiveness, and psychiatric conditions. So obviously, a person with Tay-Sachs disease is going to somehow need to uh, be treated in order to break down lipids, but then they're also going to have to have a really low-fat diet. So just a little interesting um, pearl there. All right, vacuoles. Vacuoles are large vesicles. So if a vesicle, let me show you what a vesicle, a vesicle is just like the little, they're like little cars, little cars of the cell that transport things. Well, a vacuole is going to be a giant vesicle that doesn't actually move. It just sits there. All right, they're going to be the storage for storage of materials. So they're like the closet, I guess. Or no, they're just like the storage place that you see around town, if I'm doing my analogy which I did not think through before doing this lecture, I'm sorry. They're, they're the storage place. Um, they're gonna store food, water, minerals, pigments, and poisons. So obviously we don't store pigments and poisons. It'd be really weird if we did, but plants can store pigments and poisons. So in a plant, the vacuole would be used for that. Um, so we have food, we actually do have vacuoles, animal cells do, um, but we mostly talk about the one large central vacuole in a plant cell. We do not have central vacuoles. We have vacuoles as animals. Animal cells have vacuoles to store food in a little bit of water. Um, some animals are going to have food vacuoles. Um, some paramecium are going to have contractile vacuoles. But the one that I'm most in, um, concerned with you knowing is the large central vacuole that stores water in a plant. Okay, so that's the endomembrane system. So remember, the endomembrane system starts with um, the nuclear envelope. It's the smooth ER and the rough ER. It's the Golgi apparatus and the vesicles. And then it's also lysosomes and uh, vacuoles are going to be part of the endomembrane system. So this just shows you the path of a protein when a protein gets made. And we haven't gotten there yet. So um, I'm not concerned with you knowing how proteins are made at this point. But just so you know, the endomembrane system is going to involve proteins being made, proteins being packaged, proteins being transported out of the cell. So that will be become really important a little bit later. All right, this is showing you just a giant overview of a, an animal cell and a plant cell on this page. And all I want you to see, because I know you've seen labeled diagrams of cells before in middle school, so what I'm just trying to get you to notice are the differences. So when you're looking at your paper right now, and you're looking at the animal, and you're looking at the plant cell, what do you notice as a big difference that stands out right away? And what you should be thinking is, oh, it's the shape. So the shape is a little bit different. And what makes the shape different is the plant cell has a cell wall. So I would circle that. I would circle cell wall. Plant has cell wall. Um, and the animal doesn't. And so you see this little handy dandy list right down here. So if you can look at my cursor, it says not in animal cells. So if I'm comparing the two pictures, this has already done the um, summary for you. 
Plant animal cells don't have chloroplasts, they don't have a central vacuole, they don't have a cell wall, and they don't have these things called plasmodesmata. I've gone over central vacuole, we've talked a little bit about the cell wall and we talked about cellulose, but we haven't talked about chloroplasts and plasmodesmata, so I'm going to get there. I just kind of wanted to do this overview summary before I talked about those each, those unique um, organelles, All right. Um, so the, the animal cell is, is round, and then some animal cells are going to have flagellum. Um, I can think of one in particular, a, a sperm cell is going to have a flagellum on it. All right, and then when we look at the plant cell, we notice that it doesn't have lysosomes. It doesn't have these things called centrioles that I'm going to talk about in a little while. And then um, it doesn't have flagella. Some plant sperm would, but mostly they're not going to have flagella. So... What are the big differences? I would definitely, when I looked at this piece of paper, I would definitely look at this list right here and then this list down here, and that's the difference between them. And this is a kind of an overwhelming label diagram right here. But like I said, at this point in time, you're not memorizing, memorizing it, although I would get really, I would get familiar with it if you're not already. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the organelles um, that are either um, the same between plant and animal cells or different. So both plants and animals have mitochondria. The function of the mitochondria is the site of cellular respiration. It is double membraned, meaning it has an outer and an inner membrane. The cristae are the folds of the inner membrane. And so if you look at my cursor right here, you see these folds? That's the cristae right there, the folds. And what did we say that folds do when we're talking about like the intestine? It increases efficiency. So here's another example of surface area to volume ratio being large, increasing efficiency. So you can have a smaller area with a larger, a smaller volume with a larger surface area that increases efficiency. All right, so the cristae are where ATP and cellular respiration is going to take place, which we'll talk about in a few days. And then the matrix is in the middle here. The matrix is this fluid inner compartment. And when we discuss cellular respiration, the parts of the mitochondria are going to become important. But just so you know, mitochondria is the site of cellular respiration. It has two mem it's double membrane. The cristae are these folds, and that's where ATP production takes place, and the matrix is right in the middle there. All right, chloroplasts. Plants have chloroplasts, animal cells do not. Plant cells have chloroplasts, animal cells do not. Chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis. So I told you a minute ago that plant cells and animal cells have mitochondria. Therefore, plants and animals both do cellular respiration. Only plant cells will do photosynthesis. All right, chloroplasts are also double membraned, kind of like the mitochondria. And I'm going to tell you why that's important in just a minute. Um, chloroplasts have these thylakoid discs. That's where the chloroplast is. I'm sorry, that's where the chlorophyll is, which is the green stuff. So a big chloroplast right here. They contain chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is stored in these thylakoid discs. So they almost look like poker chips stacked on each other. All right? And they contain chlorophyll. The um, anatomy of the chloroplast will become important when we talk about photosynthesis, but just for now, I want you just to be familiar with this structure. So why did I tell you mitochondria and chloroplasts are both double membraned? And then I, I hope you also notice, like, what are these dots? Dots. And then again, what are these dots? Look at all these dots right here. And then DNA, wait, are you telling me mitochondria have DNA? Wait, and look here, chloroplasts also have DNA? Oh my gosh, that's kind of crazy. So this is what makes mitochondria and chloroplasts very unique organelles because they're double membraned, they have their own DNA, and they have ribosomes. And so it's important to mention the endosymbiont theory. So to put this simply, mitochondria and chloroplasts share a similar origin, and it was it is believed that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were each their own prokaryote bacteria-like cell. So it is believed that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were each their own living like organism.
prokaryote-like, bacteria-like, and that an ancestor, eukaryote ancestor, engulfed the mitochondria, thinking it was going to eat it. Instead of digesting it, though, they formed a symbiotic relationship where the eukaryote-like ancestor was like, hey, I could totally use you for energy production. I'm just going to keep you. Same thing with a chloroplast. It is believed that this eukaryote ancestor engulfed a chloroplast instead of eating it and digesting it. It was like, yes, I can make food from the sun. I'm going to keep you. Now, this is a theory. This isn't something we've actually been able to reproduce in a lab, but it is believed that there's a lot of evidence for it. And the evidence is that the, that the mitochondria and the chloroplast are both double membrane. They both have their own ribosomes and DNA, and they can both reproduce independently within a cell. So they both undergo their own reproduction. I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, this is a very simple theory like, hey, mitochondria, let's work together. Or, hey, chloroplast, let's work together. Obviously, that probably wasn't what happened exactly. Like that conversation didn't happen. But it's a pretty good theory, as simplistic as it is. It's a pretty good theory. How else do you explain why the mitochondria and the chloroplasts have these really unique characteristics that make them almost like their own living organism themselves that could have lived by themselves? Anyway, just food for thought. This is this kind of gets into evolution, but just thought you uh, might want to know a little bit about that and what makes mitochondria and chloroplasts so cool and so special. All right, let's talk about peroxisomes. Okay, peroxisomes break down fatty acids and detox alcohol. Ooh, so which organ in your body would have a lot of peroxisomes? It would probably be the liver. Um, peroxisomes are going to produce hydrogen peroxide from alcohol, and then hydrogen peroxide is then going to further be broken down into oxygen and water. So I just want you to know that peroxisomes are there for detox. Breaking down fatty acids and detox, just simplistically breaking down fatty acids and detox. All right, then we have the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton function is for support, motility, and to regulate biochemical activities. And then I'd also like for you to write down the cytoskeleton is made up of protein. Cytoskeleton. And it literally does like what it says. It's like the skeleton. It supports. It keeps the cell from collapsing in on itself. It, um, and there are some cytoskeleton fibers that are like literally like a train track where organelles can move along kind of like a train would. You have three types of cytoskeleton fibers. And I don't want you to write down all of this because that's too much to write. I just want you to write down some simple stuff. Under microtubules, write down spindle for mitosis, or you can just write spindle because we're going to talk. I'm going to we're going to talk a lot about the spindle later. You will know what the spindle is later. So I would just write down under microtubules spindle, and then cilia and flagella. So microtubules are thick. They're made out of tubulin. Um, they form the spindle and they form the components of cilia and flagella, all right? So if you haven't got that written down, you'll need to pause because I'm moving on. Microfilaments just support, I would just write support and cell movement, support and cell movement, all right? And then intermediate filaments maintain shape. Just so you know, there's three types and they three do kind of similar things, but they each have kind of their own thing. The one most important microskeleton or cytoskeleton fiber is the microtubules. So that's what we will talk about the most. And but just so you know, there's three. So remember, so let me just kind of go back over that again in case you're confused. Microtubules, you're writing down spindle, cilia and flagella. For microfilaments, you're writing down support and cell movement. And then for intermediate filaments, you just maintain shape. I feel so sad for intermediate filaments because I never talk about them and I kind of act like, eh, they're important, but microtubules are more important. And then this is just kind of how, where they're located. So microtubules will look kind of like that. They're like spiders. Intermediate filaments are like throughout. And then the microfilaments you see are along the edges there. You don't need to write that down, but just in case you were wondering, they're each three like located in different spots also. All right, centrosomes. In this class, just write 
um, centrosomes and centrioles. We're just going to make those two words interchangeable in this class. So centrosomes and centrioles, we're just going to make those interchangeable in this class. If you are wondering, one centrosome is equal to two centrioles. Why do we have so many words for words for words? We just do. Centrosome is where microtubules are going to grow out of, and that is necessary for cell division. So at this point, we haven't talked about cell division, so you may not even be sure, like, well, what is the spindle? What's the spindle for? So remember, we said microtubules make up the spindle. The spindle is going to grow out of the centrosomes. Okay, this is where microtubules grow out of. All right. Cilia and flagella. I know there's so much information in this lecture, but I actually think I might make it under 40 minutes, so let's go. Cilia and flagella. Um, actually, I might go a little bit over 40, but that's okay because, um, you know, we're, we're doing several days in one day, so uh, this is a really condensed class. So to actually have just a 45-minute lecture each day is probably um, pretty good. So flagella are long. They're few, and they propel through water. So remember, bacteria are going to have flagella, but some animal cells will too. Cilia are short and numerous. So flagella are like tails. Cilia are kind of like little hairs. Short and numerous locomotion or movement of fluids. So your trachea has cilia. Um, and sperm have flagella. And just remember like what we said, these um, are made up of a, an arrangement of microtubules. An arrangement of microtubules. That's really all I want you to know about that. All right. And I, I don't care about you knowing the 9 plus 2 pattern. Don't even look at that. All right. So in animal cells, you have intercellular um, junctions. Um, just so you know, these are how animal cells are going to interact with each other. Um, tight junctions are where two animal cells fuse a watertight seal. So that would be like your skin. So a tight junction is where two cells fuse to form a watertight seal. Des desmosomes are like rivets. So there's like a fastening between cells. So they're like rivets. And um, filaments can actually help them um, form desmosomes. So micro intermediate filaments are actually going to help. So an example of this would be your muscle cells. So sheets of muscles um, joined together. Desmosomes are like rivets fastened together. And then gap junctions are like holes between cells. They're like channels or holes between cells where ion sugars and small molecules can pass. So all I want you to see here is there's three ways that animal cells can kind of join together. They can either join together in a watertight seal. They can join together with rivets that, fast, that fasten them together in sheets. Or they could join together with these um, channels like gap junctions and it just depends on which cells they are so tight junctions that would be like your skin cells desmosomes would be like your muscle cells and then gap junction is kind of how your heart cells are going to um, be next to each other so that ions can pass through so that the electrical conduction can happen in your heart all right and then plant cells are going to have a cell wall that protect it and maintain the shape and it's made out of cellulose which is a which macromolecule is cellulose Right, yes, it's a carbohydrate, mm -hmm. a polysaccharide. And then plant cells do not have any of these, none of these, because it has a cell wall, it's just going to form what's called a plasmodesmata. Plasmodesmata is a channel. So if you're going to compare it, a plasmodesmata and a gap junction are going to be similar between plant and animal cells. So plasmodesmata is a channel, it's like an open door between plant cells where ions and sugars and stuff like that can flow through. All right. And we already talked about the differences between plant and animal cells. You have it on that other paper, but just in case you were wondering, here's a, a um, summary. So like I said, ooh, I am gonna make it under 40 minutes. Like I said, um, this was a very detailed overview of all the organelles. Obviously for cell biology, you're going to have open note quizzes. I wouldn't take anything that wasn't actually on these notes. Um, just to make sure you actually listened to the lecture and took the notes. But just keep in mind, I would just definitely keep the, the, uh, this note packet for when you go to AP because this actually is something I will go back over during AP um, and that you do need to know this stuff in detail for AP. Alrighty, I will talk to you guys later. Thanks.